Hi, my name is Dr. Jean Seeley. I'm professor at the University of Ottawa of Medical Imaging and head of the breast imaging section at the Ottawa Hospital and Rose Ages Breast Health Centre in Ottawa, Ontario, in Canada. So the mammogram is a very important diagnostic imaging modality for detecting breast cancer. And we uh, know that mammographic density uh, is an important component of the mammogram and is classified according to the uh, American College of Radiology by Rad's Lexicon into low density or fatty replaced, scattered fibroglandular densities or B, category C, heterogeneously dense, and category D, extremely dense. And overall mammograms account for about 85% of the breast cancers uh, being detected, but we know that in women with the more dense breast tissue, the ACRC and D, the sensitivity is much lower, with less than 50% sensitivity for detecting breast cancers in the extremely dense category. Now, the visibility of a lesion really does depend on the surrounding parenchyma. So in a woman with a fatty replaced breast, as in this patient on the left, you can see very easily a very small cancer, um, whereas in a patient with more um, uh, dense breast tissue, uh, it is more difficult to appreciate the cancer, although it is detected um, in this patient with a speculated breast lesion. The BIRADS classification uh, is very important uh, for assessing mammographic uh, abnormalities, as it is for ultrasound and MRI abnormalities, and we cast categorize um, lesions according to these six categories. Zero, where we need further evaluation. One is normal. Two is a benign finding. Three, probably benign, but requires a short interval follow-up. Um, four needs a biopsy and can be categorized into 4A, 4B, and five, uh, very highly likely for malignancy, uh, or six, um, a biopsy proven cancer. And throughout the course of this talk, I will um, demonstrate which um, lesions are more suspicious and attribute the category by RADS uh, throughout. So there are four major mammographic signs of malignancy, a mass, architectural distortion, asymmetric density, and microcalcifications. So let's start with a mass. So a mass can be palpable or it can be seen on the mammogram. We're really going to focus on the mammographic masses. Um, and these are defined as a three-dimensional space-occupying lesion that is seen on two different mammographic projections. It should have completely or partially convex outward borders, and when it's dense, it should appear denser at the center of the mass than at the periphery. If we only see the mass on one projection, we really should not call it a mass, but call it an asymmetry. So we define masses uh, on uh, mammography according to five um, classifications. The shape, the margin, the density, the presence or of absence of associated calcifications, and uh, the presence of associated findings. So let's start with the shape. So shape can be oval, round, or irregular. And if it's oval, it can include a few, uh, two to three undulations. If it's round, this is um, the least common shape, in fact. Uh, we, we have to be worried about it. And if it's irregular, it's defined as having more than two or three gentle lobulations. So these two features, round and irregular, are more likely associated with malignancy than oval shape. So here is a characteristic oval mass. Um, it has about three undulations that are smooth. It looks um, very benign. Here, on the other hand, is a round mass, and this is defined as spherical, ball-shaped, circular, or globular. And you can see that it's not oval, it's rounder. And we have to be concerned it could represent a cyst, but uh, we have to pay attention and investigate further. An irregular shaped mass is neither round nor oval. Um, and uh, here is an example of an irregular shaped mass that in fact is very suspicious for malignancy. The margins are the uh, next feature that we look at for masses. So the easiest way to think of that is, are the margins circumscribed uh, well delineated, where you can actually draw a nice line around it very clearly, or not circumscribed. 
And if it's not circumscribed, we should be um, subdividing that into whether it's obscured, microlobulated, indistinct, or spiculated. So uh, a circumscribed margin is a benign feature, typically associated with benign lesions such as a fibroadenoma or a, a cyst, whereas not circumscribed is more likely associated with more malignant lesions. So let's really focus on those. Um, and by definition, we have to see at least 75% of the margin uh, to call it uh, circumscribed. So if any part of the mass is indistinct or speculated, then we would describe the mass according to the most suspicious characteristics. So any suspicious feature um, in the margin that is present should dictate the management. So here is an example of an obscured mass. We see about maybe 50% of the margin being very clearly defined, but then when we get to this lateral or more anterior portion of this mass, it's really indistinct. So we then call this an obscured margin. And we can see on the two views, we can see a little bit more of the margins being circumscribed. In this case, um, uh, about 75%, but maybe 30%. Uh, is really obscured. And so we have to call this obscured and this dictates our management. We need to do ultrasound and go further in, in terms of our investigation. Now, I just want to um, do an aside of a skin lesion because a skin lesion may appear as a sharply defined mass with a halo around it, um, but you will see part of it being obscured because that's the part that's adherent to the skin surface. So the way to avoid recalling this unnecessarily is to um, look carefully at visual inspection of the breast um, and the technologist should be recording this very carefully. So you should be able to see this uh, on the technologist note um, and they would mark the skin lesion uh, ideally for the mammogram for it to be seen. So here's an example. This patient um, had a skin lesion um, it was not marked by the technologist, but you can see it looks very circumscribed with a very um, nice halo of black or lucency around the lesion, except for this portion here where it's uh, adherent to the skin. And when we look at this view on the MLO view, you can actually see that there is the skin lesion very clearly identified. So a good technologist would have noted this and put a little skin marker uh, on this um, mammogram to help the radiologist. And here is a close-up view of that halo of the lucent um, uh, area around the skin lesion that really makes that draws your attention to the fact that it's probably a skin lesion. So back to the margins, we have um, obscured seen now. What about microlobulated? So this is where we see more than three lobulations. It's it's multiple. Some people have called this the Ritz cracker appearance, where you can see. Um, areas that are not quite clear, uh, and this is a close-up view, so too many lobulations, it's a little bit indistinct, this should cause concern, and this would have been a Biorads 4B, this turned out to be a small um, invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, the next margin is speculation, and this is where you see lines radiating from the mass. Uh, and this is the, the very suspicious uh, feature that is associated with malignancy more than 90% of the time. So appearance of this kind of lesion would give you a Biorads category 5. So the margins um, from least suspicious being circumscribed to obscured, microlobulated, indistinct, and speculated increase in risk of malignancy as you um, get to the most um, suspicious margins. Now, the next feature uh, of a mass that we should look for is density. And density, um, the, the wor most worrisome feature is high density. That is more white. Um, and in fact, when you look at the mammogram, may be the most um, dense part of the breast on the mammogram. And as you go down um, in lower re re risk of malignancy, uh, isodense or equal density, low density being even lower risk, and fat containing typically um, not associated with malignancy, but be careful because some breast cancers may entrap fat. 
So uh, a study by Woods et al. in radiology showed that lesions that had high density on the mammogram had a 70% uh, risk of malignancy, whereas those of low or equal density had a much lower risk of 22%. So let's look at some examples. Here is a woman with um, extremely dense portion of the left breast shown with the arrows. And you can see this is the densest part of the breast. This turns out to be a fairly large invasive lobular carcinoma, so high density associated with a high likelihood of malignancy. Here is another patient, uh, again with the most dense part of the breast on the right in this case, uh, quite an extensive tumor uh, in this patient, and this was uh, another invasive lobular carcinoma. Now, on the other hand, a low density, um, such as an oil cyst or a fat-containing lesion, is very, very commonly benign um, and not something that you want to further investigate. Um, on the other hand, be careful. Uh, occasionally, cancers can entrap fat, and you can see that this uh, lesion um, does have some lucent centers uh, within it, but it's quite irregular, it's not well circumscribed, and that precipitated the investigation. This was a BIRADS 4C, and this turned out to be a small invasive ductal carcinoma. So associated findings are the last feature that we look at um, uh, before we get to calcifications, um, and we're looking for changes in the skin or nipple with retraction typically um, associated with malignancy. Um, we can see uh, trabecular thickening uh, within the breast, particularly in patients where there's um, inflammatory changes. Um, and we also look for axillary lymphadenopathy and architectural distortion. So here are some examples. This is a patient who has quite a large retroreular mass. You can see that the lesion it has speculations um, it, with non-circumscribed margins, but there's also quite marked retraction of the nipple, which is what um, uh, really helps us identify it as being, being a malignant uh, tumor. Here is another example. This was the spiculated lesion, and you can see that there is uh, marked skin thickening and retraction of the skin, which uh, again shows features of malignancy. Here is a patient with two patients uh, with architectural distortion, and you can see that this um, area has retraction of the uh, adjacent parenchyma. This is the other patient who has um, retraction of the parenchyma toward that center that is white. Both of these patients had invasive ductal carcinomas. Now, it's helpful to think of architectural distortion uh, in the analogy of the central flight hubs um, at a big airport, such as Detroit or Chicago, where you can see that all of these lines uh, tracking the flights coming to a central point are really quite uh, different um, depending on where they're coming from. So it's not symmetric. It all converges on one central hub, uh, and this is what helps us identify architectural distortion. Um, here uh, is another example of architectural distortion where you can see all these hub lines coming right to the center. They're all very irregular, different, uh, and the center is quite um, white or dense. Um, this is the CC and this is the 90 degree medial lateral view, and this is a small invasive ductal carcinoma associated with marked architectural distortion. Here is another example, a patient who had had prior right breast surgery, um, and there is architectural distortion on the right from the post-surgical changes. It turned out she also had architectural distortion on the left, um, and you can see that these lines kind of gather in uh, to this center area. And you can see that this is a fairly large area of architectural distortion, and this turns out to be a contralateral invasive ductal carcinoma. It turns out that this area on the right also was a recurrent breast cancer in the surgical scar. So architectural distortion is something to train the eye as one of the hallmarks of malignancy. Very, very helpful, especially in a woman with dense breast tissue, which may lower the sensitivity of the mammogram.
Now, there is a specific indication where we see multiple masses uh, in the breasts uh, where we do not need to worry about cancer. You need to evaluate each breast separately and completely, but if all of these lesions have benign characteristics like circumscribed margins, oval shape or round shape, then the likelihood of malignancy is very low, less than 0.1%. So here is an example of um, a screen uh, uh, with multiple uh, masses. We can see there are varying sizes. They're usually oval, some are round, and you can see multiple, and they're all circumscribed masses. This means we do not have to recall this patient. They're bilateral um, cysts, uh, and they are benign. Now, we always look at the prior mammograms when we're interpreting uh, for abnormalities. And you can see this um, has the appearance of a suspicious mass in the upper outer quadrant of the right breast. Um, and we look at the prior mammograms and it looks like it might be new. But in fact, when we go back another two years earlier, you can see that this mass was present, and this is a benign mass, nothing to worry about, uh, no need for further investigation. So prior imaging reduces our uh, recalls, uh, abnormal recalls, by 5%, and we try and avoid any delays by obtaining the priors within two weeks um, to reduce the risk of an unnecessary recall. So now we're going to turn to mammographic finding of asymmetry. So by definition, an asymmetry is seen on two mammographic views, but cannot be accurately identified as a true mass. So although it may represent normal breast tissue, further evaluation is often warranted to exclude a mass or architectural distortion. So there are three types of asymmetries to be aware of. One is a global asymmetry, where it's large, greater than two centimeters uh, in one breast. A focal asymmetry, where it's small or less than or equal to two centimeters of an area of discrete dense tissue density. Um, always concerning when new, so we always want to make sure we compare to priors. And then a developing asymmetry has a high correlation with malignancy, where we can see that it has developed over the past few years. Uh, so if we only see an asymmetry in one projection, we call it an asymmetry, simple. If, it, if we see it in two views, we call it a focal asymmetry, or we can further subdivide it as a global asymmetry or developing asymmetry, with the um, level of risk being highest with a developing asymmetry. So here, let's look at some examples. Uh, this is a, a, a screen um, a detected abnormality. And if you look carefully, you can see that there is a focal asymmetry. There's an asymmetric uh, tissue in the right upper outer quadrant. It's quite asymmetric when we compare it to the left side where we don't see any similar abnormality. Um, so we, by definition, it's focal asymmetry because we see it in two views. And this ended up going for further investigation and was an invasive ductal carcinoma. So she had an ultrasound that showed an abnormality and uh, led to biopsy. So focal asymmetry is important to investigate further. Now here, on the other hand, um, are two um, limited views of the uh, MLOs uh, in another screen abnormality. And we can see that when we look at this right breast, there is an asymmetry with respect to the other breast. This was the only abnormality. It was not seen on the other um, CC view. Um, and this turned out to be just an overlapping tissue when further investigation was done with um, mam additional mammographic views. So most single view asymmetries are summation artifacts. And in fact, in one studies by Dr. Ed Sickles um, showed that of 2,023 single view findings, over 50% were summation artifacts, none of which were some, uh, identified as breast cancer. So be very careful uh, in recalling these asymmetries because it may really increase your recall rate without significantly increasing the cancer detection rate. So 
single view asymmetries have only about a 1.8% chance of being malignant. So if it's a new finding or a baseline, we would typically investigate it with tomal synthesis uh, or ultrasound um, and confirm that it represents normal glandular tissue. Uh, here are three different examples of asymmetries seen on the CC projections, only seen on the CC projections, so not on the MLO views. And ultrasound showed um, cyst, um, uh, sclerosing adenosis, and a small cancer, it, respectively, in these three different patients. So it's very difficult to say which uh, is going to be the malignancy, so we typically investigate with ultrasound and um, additional mammographic or tomal synthesis views. Um, okay. Here is another example of uh, focal asymmetry. You can see in this patient uh, right here, this um, has developed over the past few uh, four years. So by definition, this is a developing asymmetry and we investigate it further with additional mammographic views and ultrasound. And this turns out to be a small invasive ductal carcinoma. So developing asymmetry is really an important finding, uh, and um, although uncommon, seen only in about 0.16% of all screening mammograms, has a moderate likelihood of malignancy um, and uh, has an increased likelihood of malignancy when associated with calcifications, architectural distortion, or being palpable, and accounts overall for 6% of malignancies in uh, several large series. So beware of the developing asymmetry, and again, this underscores the importance of looking at comparison mammograms. So we're going to turn now to calcifications as the other major mammographic um, abnormality to focus on. So what are calcifications? They're the accumulation of calcium salts in the breast, seen as small white dots, and the important thing to know is the visibility does not depend on the breast tissue density. They're often associated with malignancy um, about 30% of the time, and they uh, account for almost 30% of lesions detected at screening mammography. They're a very important sign of ductal carcinoma in situ, which may only demonstrate magnumographic calcifications in four out of five women. So they're really an important finding that we have to pay attention to. So according to the lexicon, you should think of calcifications in three separate ways. One, are they typically benign, in which case we don't need to do anything further. Second, do they have any features of suspicious morphology? And then lastly, what is the distribution of the calcifications? So let's look at typically benign calcifications to start with. So there's a list um, that we can uh, refer to for typically benign, including skin, vascular, coarse or popcorn light, rod-like, round, lucent-centered, eggshell or rim, milk of calcium, suture, um, and dystrophic. And uh, I won't have time to go through all of the examples of benign, but um, we'll focus on some of the more typically benign or more common ones that we see. So here are some examples of suture calcifications um, and dystrophic calcifications in a woman who's previously had breast surgery. Those we don't need to worry about. Skin calcifications are lucent-centered, and you'll see these small areas of um, a lucency within the calcifications that correspond to where the hair follicle is coming through. So these are very typically benign. Uh, we also, in this case, have a very coarse popcorn-like calcification from a fibroadenoma. Again, something we don't need to worry about. Now, tangential views for skin calcifications can be done to confirm that they are in the skin. And this is another patient who had these very faint calcifications and luckily, we were able to do, uh, the technologist got a tangential view showing them in the skin, confirming that the, the tattoo sign of skin calcifications. When you see typical lucent centered calcifications, however, it's not essential to obtain tangential views to confirm that they are skin calcifications. You can characterize them as typically benign. Now, large rod-like calcifications are also very typically benign. They are usually seen in postmenopausal women 
and they're usually bilateral. These are ductile calcifications that are very smooth along their border, um, and they kind of radiate from the um, nipple and retroreal area. And they're typically quite large and coarse, so more than 0.5 millimeters in their thickness. So when we see these calcifications, these are typically benign and they're associated with the secretory or plasma cell mastitis. Another very typically benign calcifications are these round punctate um, lobular calcifications that are very diffuse. Um, they're often seen bilaterally and they've been called a thousand points of light. Um, in this case, when we have multiple, they're all very clearly defined as round, punctate, um, and very easy to identify as being benign. These we do not worry about. Typically benign calcifications uh, form in the asini of the lobules. So cancers typically form within the, the ductal uh, component, whereas the benign calcifications forming in the milk um, glandular forming area um, are benign. And when they're very small or less than 0.5 millimeters, we call them punctate. So here is a pathologic specimen showing the asini, uh, or an, or an asinus filled with calcifications, um, and what that corresponds to are these calcifications that look almost grape-like, and you can draw lines around them corresponding uh, to the asini. These are very reassuring calcifications that are typically benign. If they're new, we typically will biopsy them, but these are benign calcifications, uh, lobular calcifications of sclerosing adenosis. So um, here are some uh, other calcifications. These are punctate, um, very, very difficult to characterize. Uh, there is a small percentage that do turn out to be malignant. So if they're new, they should be biopsied. This patient um, did not have a biopsy. And one year later, she developed um, an invasive ductal carcinoma at that site. So be careful if they're new. Uh, you should biopsy them, but they may often be benign. Uh, here is another type of calcification that we see um, quite commonly. Uh, these are calcifications that appear round on the, cal the craniocaudal view, but when we do the 90 degree magnification view, you can see them layering out beautifully. And this is milk of calcium. So milk of calcium is a suspension of these small particles of calcium within the uh, asinus of the um, gland forming portion of the uh, breast. And when they are um, turned into a 90 degree mediolateral projection, you can see that they layer beautifully. Uh, and this is what we see is the teacup calcifications on the mammogram. So the 90 degree mediolateral projection is critical uh, for demonstrating these um, teacup calcifications. So here we have on the CC view, these round calcifications that layer very, very nicely on the 90 degree medial lateral projection. And these are what we call the teacup calcifications. They're different from these calcifications circled in red, which do not layer on the 90 degree medial lateral projection. The calcifications in green are milk of calcium, and the ones in red are sclerosing adenosis. So the layering calcifications with the 90 degree medial lateral magnification view is really critical to demonstrate these benign calcifications that do not require biopsy. So let's look now at suspicious morphology. Um, calcifications that are punctate, as I've shown, are typically benign unless they're new, in which case you should pay attention and biopsy. The ones that we pay attention to for biopsy and are typically BIRADS 4B would be coarse heterogeneous, greater than 5.5 millimeters, amorphous, too small to define, these are typically BIRADS 4A, fine pleomorphic and fine linear branching, which are usually BIRADS 4B or 4C. So here um, are um, coarse heterogeneous calcifications. They're irregular, quite conspicuous calcifications when we see them on magnification views, typically between 0.5 and 1.0 millimeters. They tend to coalesce, and they're associated with malignancy in um, 7%. These were DCIS coarse heterogeneous calcifications. 
Here is another patient with extensive coarse heterogeneous calcifications that were seen in a woman who presented with metastases of unknown origin, uh, and these were DCIS that were high nuclear grade. Amorphous calcifications are usually too small or hazy to define, and here is an example of these very um, amorphous calcifications. Here is another patient with quite a larger extent of amorphous calcifications. The um, association of malignancy is about 20%, um, and those were DCIS of low nuclear grade, while these were sclerosing adenosis. Fine calcifications can be divided into fine pleomorphic, and here is an example of fine pleomorphic calcifications. When you look at the calcifications, they are all very variable in shape and density, um, so they're pleomorphic, but they're small, and they don't um, have any definitive benign calcifications. In fact, you could make uh, the case that some of these are fine linear branching. Just fine pleomorphic calcifications are associated with malignancy in up to 40%. Fine linear branching, on the other hand, where we can see these um, calcifications that are definitely branching and potentially along a ductal pattern, very extensive calcifications in the, uh, this example um, are associated with malignancy uh, in even higher likelihood of 80% malignancy. And both of these different patients were DCIS of high nuclear grade. Fine linear branching is the most worrisome um, morphology for these calcifications, and you can see that they correspond to the ductal pattern where the uh, malignancy is forming uh, in the ducts, not in the asini. So the most suspicious features for calcifications are fine pleomorphic and fine linear branching, with the other um, descriptors um, being less likely, but also associated with malignancy in a smaller number of patients. So let's look now at the distribution. And this is uh, subdivided into diffuse, regional, grouped, linear, and segmental. So it's a little confusing because linear um, is used to describe the morphology as well as the distribution. But we can see um, how this um, applies to calcifications. So diffuse is a random distribution throughout the breast, and you can see this um, in this case with multiple uh, round um, punctate calcifications that are diffusely seen throughout both breasts. This is very uncommonly associated with malignancy, very rare. Uh, regional distribution, on the other hand, is associated with malignancy about 26% of the time. It's calcifications that occupy over two centimeter area and that don't conform to a duct distribution. So here is an example of regional distribution of calcifications, as in I showed you this case earlier with uh, extensive DCIS. And you can see that this um, doesn't conform to a duct distribution, um, but it's not um, uh, typically benign, and this is regional. Here is another example of distribution of calcifications that occupies more than one quadrant and more than two centimeters. Um, and you can see that it's uh, more than just a ductal pattern and it's um, a global, or excuse me, regional distribution of calcifications that turns out to be DCIS. And you can see this um, on the MRI with the enhancement, non-mass enhancement of this uh, patient with DCIS. Grouped distribution uh, is a smaller distribution, typically um, five or more calcifications within uh, a two centimeter area. They're difficult to see, but you can identify these small calcifications that are tightly grouped, uh, in this case, less than one centimeter area. And these can be associated with malignancy in a third of patients. Uh, here is a case, uh, this patient was not recalled for biopsy, and two years later, uh, she had uh, a high-grade DCIS. This patient had been recommended to have a biopsy, but refused, and this demonstrates the natural history of these calcifications that progressed to high-grade DCIS um, in that two-year period when she finally agreed to the biopsy.
So the uh, grouped calcification distribution uh, it then is followed by linear distribution, where calcifications are arrayed in a line. And these are associated with malignancy much more frequently, 68 to 70 percent of the time. So here are calcifications. Um, and they're not linear calcifications by morphology. They're fine pleomorphic calcifications with a few coarse heterogeneous calcifications. But when you look at the distribution, they configure uh, along a linear pattern. So this uh, should uh, raise strong concerns for malignancy and would be assigned a BIRADS category 4C. So these turned out to be DCIS of intermediate nuclear grade. Malignant calcifications, we have to think of, develop in the ducts close to the terminal ductal lobular unit. And the calcifications represent necrotic debris within the ducts. So if we think about where the cancers develop within the ducts near the TDLU, what we see on pathology is the calcifications forming within the duct that is malignant, and the calcifications show staining as pink. And what happens is as the cells die, they produce the calcification. Uh, and they then configure to the linear pattern of the duct in which they're forming. So we can see here this is a duct which is filled with these with this necrotic material. These are all um, uh, necrotic debris from DCIS. So there may be no calcifications in some portion of the duct where there's not yet de debris that has calcified, but we may see quite a lot of um, calcifications where there's been most active cell death and necrosis and debris. The last one to think about is segmental uh, distribution. And segmental distribution is config, uh, conforming to a pattern that is occupying more than one duct. So it's in uh, a duct or multiple ducts and their branches. So it typically will radiate toward the nipple and have a sort of segmental distribution or a triangular distribution with um, that converging on the nipple. This is a very suspicious um, descriptor for the distribution of calcifications and is associated with malignancy the most frequently, over 70%. And this was a high-grade DCIS. So in this case, we have the morphology is somewhat linear and linear branching, coarse heterogeneous calcifications as well that are is that are, is in a segmental distribution. So the features that are associated with malignancy to summarize are pleomorphism, variability in shape, size, and density, linear and linear branching forms, and then the segmental distribution within one lobe of the breast. And any interval change should really be cause for a concern for biopsy. So the distribution uh, in terms of uh, most likely to be malignant is segmental, with diffuse being the much uh, the lowest um, in the risk of malignancy. So 9% of cancers present as calcifications or masses or both. And then 10% of cancers present as other uncommon signs. So to summarize, we have the mammographic signs of malignancy are mass, architectural distortion, asymmetric density, and microcalcifications. Uh, and so really remembering um, how to describe these calcifications will help you to determine the likelihood of malignancy. Um, think uh, that positive predictive value for malignancy is highest with calcifications. Really be careful about not missing those and then really training your eye to the architectural distortion, which is the second highest positive predictive for malignancy. Mass is then uh, next in line, 9.7%, and developing asymmetry, 7.4%, with the uh, one single view findings and focal asymmetry in this study showing uh, much less uh, likely to be associated with malignancy. So thank you very much for your attention. This um, is a summary of the mammographic interpretation and uh, um, be happy to um, have questions if you need to um, email me for any further investigation.